appreciate you having me out here. Um, this is uh, not just my situation. I have a business partner, J Jim Cunningham, in the back there, and a, a team of people that work with us at Eurodale. Um, we're a full-service design build firm. Um, so we do uh, soup to nuts, uh, predominantly single-family homes. And uh, we're, we're just located um, in the design decor district. And we've done this for 20 years, um, but not missing middle housing, obviously, for, for 20 years. So predominantly single-family stuff. Um, the McMansions everyone loves to hate. Uh, we did a lot of those and uh, still do a lot of those. So big additions, renovations. But when we look at these projects um, from the design standpoint and then the planning standpoint, um, the rubber kind of hits the road when you, when you get to build it. And, and that's where you look at what is this actually going to cost. And so we have that nice little Venn diagram. Everybody's probably seen these types of things. You can have it uh, two ways, not all three, fast, cheap, or great. And uh, you want to take a look when we're looking at mi missing middle housing, um, and, you're, and, and it's not just budgeting for construction, it's kind of, um, if you just look at what it costs to put a hammer to a nail, you're missing a lot of the performa. And I know we had a, a, a gentleman up here that spoke about performa, but you can't uh, avoid the analysis that has to be there as far as what's your market going to be. So who are your, um, who are your end buyers going to be or who are your tenants going to be? So you want to get a sense for suite type. So we just did, for example, uh, a triplex in the Young and Lawrence uh, area, and we were permit permitted to go up to four units there. Um, but what we did was we took a look at, you know, who are the people that live in this area? And so it actually made better sense for us to downzone it from a fourplex to a triplex to be able to get larger uh, family-sized units in there. It just paid better, um, and we had one less tenant to manage, which is always nice. Um, so you, you have to analyze your soft costs as well as your hard costs. In that instance, um, so Sean Galbraith was up here uh, earlier, and he worked with us on this project. And the soft cost was something we underestimated. And we underestimated it because neighbors. And that neighbor opposition is something that took us to T-Lab and added, um, I'd say, a good year to that, to that process. And as a result, a whole bunch of carrying costs legal and planning fees. And so those are, those are critical uh, things to look at. Then, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to see that screen there. Um, then you have your hard costs, so your foundation, your framing, all the stuff that goes into actually building a place. And then you have your operations, so you, everybody knows your TMI, all that type of stuff. So when we look at uh, budgeting and tendering, you have to get extremely detailed. And you'll see, this is just a, a screen grab of an Excel sheet that we use in order to, uh, to budget these. Now, one of the critical pieces we have here is this first line item um, is the projected cost. Now, this has to be actively updated as you're going through the project. And so you'll see that second line item, final price, and the third, the differential. And if you're not updating this as you go, you're missing an opportunity to make changes through the project. So, for example, if you have 33 $150 under budget, you can make other decisions through the project to increase the efficiency of the building, the built envelope, the HVAC systems, et cetera. So this goes through every major step of construction in extreme detail, and we're updating it as we, as we go through the, uh, through the project. When you're looking at trades and, and uh, suppliers, it's not just about the cheapest price, obviously. If you focus on the cheapest price and you, you try to um, get a negative number or an under budget number the whole way along, in a city like Toronto, in a very busy environment, you're gonna find you get what you pay for. And so a lot of times these projects, we're selecting trades and suppliers that are actually over the budget. And so, um, you know, if you're a citizen developer and this is your first rodeo, so to speak, you definitely wanna watch out for um, what those experiences are, what those skills are of the people that are actually going to be building the project. And so don't be lazy, call the references, see the work that they're doing, um, visit the sites, etc. cetera. Um, from a management perspective, the question is, do you hire a firm like ours that actually GCs the project, or do you GC it yourself? And that's going to come down to, do you have the skill and experience to know what to look for? And also, do you have the time to do it? It's not 
you know, something that, that manages itself. Um, <clears throat> and then we get into the question about, do we build new or we do, do we do this as an addition renovation? Um, so when we look at the costs, the soft cost elements, we have surveys, committee of adjustments, building permits, um, MPAC assessments when projects are done, they are all higher as a new build. So committee of adjustment, for example, more than double the fees. Um, permitting fees as well, much higher. Uh, landscapes will be much higher if you do a complete teardown where you completely uh, raise the building and, and tear the whole lot out. Um, and there's value in the existing structure. So, you know, if you have existing foundation, existing framing that you can work with, not only are you lowering your greenhouse ga gas emissions, your uh, carbon footprint, carbon footprint, sorry, um, but those have financial aspects. So if you don't have to build a new foundation, obviously that's a line item from the, from the previous slide that you don't have a cost for. Um, same thing with framing. Uh, where that tipping point happens, so this is a project we did in, um, for a client actually, that was in the junction. So it was an existing home uh, that we converted to a fourplex. And because we were keep maintaining ceiling heights um, on the main level, second level, and third level, we didn't have to rip out all that framing. And that's obviously a, a big element. But at the basement level, we, we needed to lower it. So we needed to underpin it. So there's a huge cost uh, with respect to that. And that comes about with waterproofing costs as well as your existing services. So if we're changing your, um, how you're heating and cooling the space, um, whether or not you're going to do split HVAC systems. If you're four units or more, you have to. Um, but if they're less, they can share some of that. Uh, and you also have, with existing buildings, some grandfathered setbacks. They're not truly grandfathered in that if you're going back or going up from them, you will need committee of adjustment. But with the existing building situated where it is, the committee is not going to lose all respect for that. So they are going to acknowledge uh, that that's there and work with you as far as topping it up. Now, our analysis typically is, all things being equal, if we were to build this new or do it as an addition renovation, you'd have about a $250,000 delta, which is not insignificant when you're looking at the cost of, of construction. Now, that's different on every project, but in this case, that was the savings that they were looking at. Um, <clears throat> famous uh, triplex that we, that we did uh, with Sean, as I was talking about. Um, this one was also done as an addition and renovation. Now, when you're looking at it from, if we're building for a client, there are two values. So there's construction value, resale value, um, and then there's ownership value. So if they're going to be living in the building, which the, the prior one here, she's actually living in the property, as well as renting it out, whereas this one, where it's for tenants, it's strictly construction value. It's a, it's a pro forma that is totally different and that it has to pay for itself. And the question is, how long is it gonna take to pay for itself? So we take a look at, um, in our case, as I said, we do design, build, custom homes, predominantly additions, renovations. We kind of shifted to do these multiplexes as a, um, a bit of a side hustle. We saw the, the pricing of housing becoming completely unaffordable. And so we looked at it and said, if we're going to um, have something to, to uh, pass on to our kids or provide housing potentially for our children, we need to potentially build it. And so we look at it as a buy and hold. And so our pro forma on this is not to um, build it for someone, not to sell it, but to actually rent it out. And as I was saying, the three units made better sense for us, but from a cost perspective, what we paid for the original building, what we put into it, and what the eventual rentals are, this is a long, long term investment. And that's one of the biggest challenges facing anybody here or anybody in the city that's looking at doing this, is you are, uh, if you're gonna keep it and rent it, even though rents are, are strong in Toronto and, and growing stronger every day, this is a 25 year play. So there's not a ton of people that are willing to, to, to carry the costs of doing that. So you need to look at, okay, in this multiplex versus building a single family home, what are some of those cost elements? And I, I know uh, Craig and Trevor are talking about 
um, the design elements that are that are can be critical as uh, as far as the quality of the suite, which will uh, translate into the eventual sale price or the eventual rental price or the eventual enjoyment if you're living there. But as soon as you are a multiplex dwelling of this size, you have fire and sound separations, which are obviously much higher than you would have in a single family home. Uh, secondary egress, so this is maybe falling away, um, but there are secondary egress costs. Daylighting, um, so when you have, in this case, and we're, we're cropped in the image, huge long bowling alley. This property is 21 feet wide, and so long bowling alley, you have some as of right existing windows because we used to be able to, to put those in so you can play with those. But you have either fire shutters or fire rated windows, fire rated doors, add costs. Uh, third floor loading, so if you go adding from a two story to a, th a third story, you may have some foundation works that you have to do that you have to account for. So that's a little bit of a TBD. Uh, split HVAC systems, so you can do, in this, in this case we, hydronically heated the basement and we did all the hot water from a single boiler but all the air handlers are separated so um, if you're doing those types of things then you can separate meter uh, the building um, you're also looking at multiple kitchens so versus a standard custom home cost and everybody kind of looks what's the cost per square foot to build is the question we used to always get uh, asked the most at home shows um, these are going to add as soon as you put three or four kitchens into a place Obviously, it's one of the most expensive uh, aspects. So uh, when we look at a project and we say, okay, how do we reverse, maybe reverse engineer this to make this pencil, um, Craig and Trevor, with the stroke of a pen, can add or remove ten dollars or $20,000 to a project very easily. An architect designer has that, has that power in their pen. Now, a very famous architect, Barry Hoban, out of Ottawa, uh, told me 20 years ago, uh, there's four things that affect every project budget, the world over, commercial, residential, what have you. And that list is there. So area, so if you're 3,000 square feet instead of 2,000 square feet, obviously the 3,000 square foot is going to be more expensive. But it's not a perfect linear equation. So you do have an economy of scale that comes about with greater square footages. Um, architectural complexity it says circle versus square. Uh, it's easier to build a perfect square than it is a perfect circle. And I know there's been some conversations here today um, about that Mayan pyramid step back um, scenario that most mid-rise uh, properties have, have had to comply with. We had to do it here. We had to cut the third floor back four feet, the second floor back two feet. And there's costs associated with that, structural costs, roofing costs, um, those types of things. So the more basic it is, the cheaper it obviously is. Uh, the third one, house is a system. So these are the things you don't see. So how are you heating the space? How are you cooling the space? Uh, how are you insulating the space? It's the things behind the wall, things that are, are critical in the performance, the efficiency, um, and the, the comfort and health of the occupants, but are things you don't see. So when they're in a sale, our experience is, when they're in a sale perspective, um, these things aren't focused on. On a rental perspective, they're also not focused on. Um, people buy and rent on emotion, so when they see the space, if they think it looks nice, um, they typically are, are willing to make that purchase or investment into it. So those house as a system pieces um, are something you can draw back on without potentially really negatively affecting um, your eventual sale or, or rental. But if you're living in the space or you want tenants that are super happy spending a bit more money on that or a building that's efficient, spending on that uh, can be helpful. And then the quality of finish. So is it brick, is it stucco, is it stone, uh, siding, hardwood floors, are they pre-finished, site finished, what have you, um, all have, uh, have an impact. But those visual ones are massive when you go to turn the property, rental, sale, as any realtor here, here could tell you. Um, <clears throat> so when do we do these things? And we were having a conversation at lunch it would have been great if these multiplex bylaws were in place 10 years ago when money was, <laughs> was cheaper, uh, housing was cheaper, and trades, material, and labor um, were much cheaper. Here we are in a higher interest rate environment, super expensive housing market, and coincidentally, very expensive trade uh, market. So materials, and this is, this is what the biggest driver is. So we say, when, what, is it a good time to do it? Well, the best time was yesterday. 
But yes, now is as good a time as any, and it's better than it's going to be tomorrow. And the reason for that is, and this gets in the news a lot, inflation. Now, materials tend to go up at or below, traditionally, the rate of inflation. But you can see in the graph at the top, construction wages increase exponentially higher than inflation. And so there's been some talk in the news about wages not increasing the same rate as inflation, but in construction, they have. And so the chart in the bottom, in this last point here, the only time in history that we have had negative construction costs are in the Great Depression. And at that time, the highest, depending on, on which index you look at, was under 5% reduction in the cost of construction. So uh, <laughs> there's probably some debate. Are we on the precipice of another great uh, recession or depression? Um, but odds are in your favor that it's going to be less expensive to do this project today than it is five years from now, for example. So we recommend if you're looking from a budgetary perspective, trying to do this sooner rather than later, which is why these as of right approvals are important. Because if we can, we look at that 31 Roslyn project we did with Sean, what should have been a six month approval process was 18 months. So that project from start to completion was construction during the pandemic was a little slower as well, was 36 months. So you have carrying costs over those 36 months, which are, are not insignificant. And ultimately, uh, when we did the, the study on it, over 25 years, that just that neighbor opposition, if you will, added $111 a month per unit over 25 years. Which you think, okay, 111, but in perpetuity, that, that's significant, right? And so um, if, we're, if we're able to do things, and Craig's right, um, absolutely, uh, at this project here, this one here, uh, we just are doing a garden suite right now, approval, and we did everything we could to make it um, not go to committee of adjustment, strictly because we know exactly what the neighbors will do as far as contesting it. So if you can do these things as of right, it's great. But with these approvals, you need to factor in a few things. One, this house that we renovated has legal non-conforming side yard setbacks, front yard setbacks, rear yard setbacks. As soon as you go to do anything structural to those walls, either building on top, extending uh, outward, that will trigger a technical variance. So sometimes it's unavoidable, so you have to plan from a budgetary perspective that neighbors likely are not going to love the, the fact that we have renters, multiplex tenancies, coming into that space. So you, you, want, to, you want to plan um, accordingly. Um, so when we look at, from a budget perspective and an opportunity perspective, uh, and, and, and that's one thing Sean was kind of talking about, like what should you be looking out for? If you follow that, we call it the Ehon crystal ball, you can see the path these approvals have come down. So when you're looking at opportunities, properties in close proximity to uh, high density transit like subways um, are gonna be next. So this is, a, this is a property that we have adjacent to a, to a subway stop and we're looking, do we add to the building and create you know, a, a 15 unit building or do we sever it and build three stacked towns beside it? And so looking at those opportunities um, because there is going to be a massive uptick in value that comes about if all of a sudden you can build 10 units on a lot, right? or more, depending on, on where that property is. And so, first laneways, garden suites, multiplex, PMTSAs, uh, single egresses falling, main streets, all those types of things, you can almost see where the values of those properties are going to go. So if you're looking long term and you say, okay, let's pick these up now because the change is coming, that's where you'll be, uh, be rewarded. Now, on the rental side, this is why uh, I was talking about the yield percentage, seek out a 5% yield, which is a 20 year payback. You're likely gonna end up at a 4% once, uh, once things are, are built. Then look at, okay, what are our rental upticks likely to be? What's the capital appreciation going to be? And look at 
your options. Sale, if you sell the property, you have a capital gain if you, if you profit. Um, or the opportunity to re-leverage that property and do this again at another, at another site. Um, so when you have a capital, uh, a capital sale like that, you, you're losing 25% of the gain, right? So then your buying power after is, is lower, whereas you could uh, re-leverage. And then look at it from, a, and this is how we've done it, look at it as a delayed gratification. So we, don't, we haven't paid ourselves to build that. And so we're looking at getting paid as these tenants run out that 25 year period. So thank you very much for your time, I appreciate it. And hopefully there was some valuable insights there. Thank you.